coming up from NBA in Las Vegas. It takes off like a helicopter, flies like a jet. Heads up, something else new from Garmin and bigger is better. And there is a science to those deluxe interiors. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. Build and fly with the Sonics Aircraft B models. The B models offer more room and comfort, more fuel, more panel space, more engine choices, and the same great Sonics Aircraft flight characteristics. Learn more at sonicsaircraft.com. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Melissa Rudinger. Hello and welcome to Las Vegas, this week home to the National Business Aviation Association Convention and Exposition. And this week, Melissa, a more somber tone than previous conventions we've been to. Everywhere you look, reminders of the terrible tragedy that struck this city a little over a week ago. As NBA celebrates its 70th anniversary, it also paid tribute to the city, a place now called Las Vegas Strong. What is apparent to us now is that it is a city of strength. It is a city of compassion. It's a city of selflessness. And we are honored to be part of that. NBAA is going to host the kind of show that will make Las Vegas proud. Because over the last week, you have made us very proud indeed. The day before the convention opened, NBA announced a $10,000 contribution to the Las Vegas Victims Fund and asked convention goers to make their own contributions. If you want to help, a Clark County Commissioner Steve Scalise has started a GoFundMe campaign. Just type Las Vegas Victim Funds into your favorite search engine. But the big political issue here at NBAA is air traffic control privatization and the threat it poses to all facets of general aviation. There is legislation on Capitol Hill which threatens to destroy the future of business aviation, of general aviation in the United States. The signs were everywhere. More than 200 general aviation organizations are fighting the legislation to give the airlines control of the skies. Some of the association leaders told convention goers of some dire consequences of changing the safest, most efficient, and most cost-effective air traffic control system in the world. It's a giveaway to a monopoly of public assets. But then the other ingredient to that is there is no then oversight that protects the public good and that Congress is not involved. And so there we are out hanging in the breeze. The thing that concerns me the most though is I view this as a two-phase program on behalf of uh, you know, Congressman Schuster and the airlines. The first phase is do and say whatever you have to do to get this thing passed. And then when it's passed and it's implemented and we're a few years down the road, then we're really going to do what we wanted to do. And then you're going to see the user fees. You're going to see a case be built for general aviation not to be allowed in high density traffic areas and at hub airports. I see that case easily being made. And education is still our biggest challenge out of the 435 members of the House to understand what this is about. It's not privatization. It is not something that should be just rolled through for, under the category of creating success for this administration. It is a really big darn deal. They ought to pay attention to it. Mark said he worries about people tiring of the issue before it's resolved, and the legislative battle may continue into next year. That's why it's important that pilots repeatedly call their member of Congress and ask them to continue to vote no on H.R. 2997. Because in many cases when you're talking to your member of Congress, it's a pretty quick conversation. You're trying to get across the three or four basic points, which it's not privatization. This is going to hurt general aviation. It hasn't worked anywhere else in the world in general aviation. This quick checklist will tell you why it's also probably not legal and will cause more de deficit and slow down the, uh, the conversion to modernizing our system. You can find that checklist and the number to call Congress on our website. Even the FAA administrator had to talk about the privatization issue here in Las Vegas, but he carefully danced around the issue. He has to. His boss, Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, has fallen in line behind the White House and supports ATC privatization. Huerta? Hard to say. So it is the time to have a meaningful discussion about how we can improve the services that we deliver today. Well, I need something that helps the FAA build on its unparalleled safety record and continues the pace of modernization of our air traffic control system. So I want to encourage you and every other voice in this debate to carefully consider the many and sometimes competing viewpoints that are being expressed. So, Melissa, 
clearly the administrator is dancing on this issue. What do you hear from inside the FAA? He is, and most of the rank and file are you know, pretty tight-lipped, but I will tell you the new deputy administrator of the FAA came from the Trump White House, and he's publicly stated that the FAA supports the bill. So, All right, well, it'll know. be interesting given that Huerta's term is up at the, basically at the end of the year. So he's going to be replaced, although, you know, at this point, what are they going to do, fire him if he came out and, and said what's on his mind? But uh, anyhow, so it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, under the new administrator. It will. Stay tuned. Yeah, absolutely. Administrator Huerta also used his speech time to chastise General Aviation for not equipping with ADSB out fast enough. As you all know, all aircraft flying in controlled airspace must be equipped with ADSB out by that date. Now this deadline's been around a while. It was set during the administration of President George W. Bush, and it's not going to change. But no matter how many times I say that, too many GA aircraft owners are delaying, are delaying taking their planes in for these upgrades. But here's the funny thing about that. Some 30% of GA aircraft are currently equipped, but not all GA aircraft will fly in airspace where ADS-B will be required. All airliners will need it though, and only 20% of them are equipped, so the people who claim they can do modernization better than the FAA have yet to completely modernize their fleet with the cornerstone of next-gen ADS-B. Okay, enough of the politics for this show. Now to things, we come to NBAA 4, the airplanes and the avionics, and there are some interesting new developments to talk about. The first, something called a tri-fan from XTI Aircraft. It's still in the development phase, but if it all comes together, it could represent a radical change in business travel. It's an, a fixed wing aircraft that takes off and lands like a helicopter. It can fly like a business jet or any other jet, going to 29,000 feet and 300 knots with a 670 nautical mile range when it takes off and lands vertically, or even beyond that if you, can take, if you take off like a normal airplane. It's a hybrid. A turbine engine powers three electric generators. There are dual electric motors powering each of the fans, and a battery provides the extra boost needed for vertical takeoff and landing and emergency power should the turbine engine fail. XTI expects to have a 60% scale prototype flying by the end of next year. Projected cost of the tri-fan is $6.5 million. So it's a pretty interesting aircraft, whether or not it gets anywhere, we'll, we'll see. But you know, 300 knots uh, is max speed. It's fly at about 270 knots at flight level uh, 290, a uh, range of 600 miles if it takes off from, uh, uh, from a vertical standpoint because it needs a lot of extra fuel to do that. But uh, when it takes off from a runway, it will be about 1,200 nautical mile range. So anyhow, interesting airplane. We'll see how it fits into the air transportation system and also interesting where the, where the FAA is going to figure out how to certify it within the current regulations or the new Part 23 rewrite. So it could be one that benefits from that. Well, that hopefully it will, and it's a fast mover and versatile, but wow, pretty, pretty steep price tag. <laughs> yeah. While the flying prototype of the TriFan is still years away, the new single-engine Stratus jet prototype flew to NBAA, and it's here in the indoor static display. Since we saw it at AirVenture, the company started building a second prototype, and the test aircraft has logged over 80 hours of test flying. Target cruise speed for the jet is 400 knots with a range from 1,200 to 1,600 nautical miles. The Pilatus PC-24 is much closer to being in customers' hands. The second prototype is also here in the indoor static display. Pilatus expects FAA certification by the end of this year. First deliveries will be to fractional provider Plain Sense. And another new design slightly larger than the PC-24 is the Citation Longitude. Textron brought a full production model to the show to debut the new interior and show off the Garmin G5000 avionics. The 3500 nautical mile 476 knot airplane is undergoing flight testing on its way to certification. The new Honeywell engines were just certified last week. And this is reputed to be the biggest airplane in its class, Bombardier's Global 7000. The company's fourth test aircraft flew to Las Vegas to make its public debut. It has four cabin zones because, hey, one is just never enough, right? A 7,400 nautical mile range, and it cruises at up to 0.925 Mach. Base price, a little under $72 million. And with super long range airplanes like the Global 7000, it's the interior that really matters to customers, down to the last detail. AOPA editor-at-large Tom Horn shows us what goes into making the insides perfect. The big jet manufacturers put a lot of effort into making the perfect space for their customers as they fly across the country or the world. The bigger jets feature multiple zones, which are separate seating areas for different purposes. Conversation, 
conferencing or dining, and a sleeping area. Technology is also big in the cabin, what with advanced entertainment and cabin control and connectivity systems. In recent years, the large cabin segment of the turbine market has been very popular, and with that brought a lot of emphasis on interiors, ergonomics, design, amenities, that sort of thing. And it's trickled down to smaller aircraft. One of these aircraft is Embraer's Phenom 300E, which debuted at MBAA this year. For Embraer, the focus areas for a great interior design are ergonomics, comfort, and design. They use the analogy of a humble butler that serves the passengers what they want without asking and then leaves when no longer needed. So that's the metaphor, the humble butler with wings. But why not have things presented to you without you having to ask for it? You know, if you want to reach up and turn a light on, we have capacitive switches here in the upper technology panel that appear when your hand gets close because it's gesture based and then disappear when your hand is pulled away. So just like a butler, they provided something and then took it away when it wasn't needed. So those simple features really play into that story. And the level of personalization is extending to more personalized cabin concepts. Eddie Sato is a design consultant for Embraer and a former designer for Disney. Sato creates incredible interiors that transform the space down to the smallest detail. Aircrafts are expensive, they're wonderful experiences, but being in the plane, the little things you touch, those little details, what if they could reward your closer inspection? One of his designs for the Embraer lineage is called Sky Ranch. It's not about cowboys and Indians or John Wayne or any of those things. It's about the tranquility of the escape of being up in the clouds. So interiors can be far more than just comfortable places to spend the time while en route. They're spaces where travelers derive a kind of psychic nourishment, whether they know it or not. In an aircraft, you, you're in here. Everything matters. It's an immersive world. But how can you make and think of every little detail and be kind of manic about it on the, on the customer's behalf and really just live for every stitch in that seat and make every little piece of it something when the customer walks and they just smile and just go, wow. Tom Horn, AOPA Live. Wow, those are some pretty amazing looking interiors. Right, right. You never know the science uh, that goes into making those things as luxurious and comfortable as they are. It's pretty, pretty amazing what they have to do. Blown away. Well, hey, when we come back, pilots have been asking for it for a long time. And a better wing electrically. It'll be live this week from NBA continues in just a moment. The smoke is on. He's giving everything that he's got. Oh, I love it! He's there! The Red Bull Air Race World Championship returns to Indianapolis Motor Speedway, October 14th and 15th. Tickets now on sale. Welcome back to Las Vegas and the NBAA convention. While there is no shortage of ideas for new aircraft at NBAA, many of the companies here are in the market of improving the existing fleet. Tamarack Aerospace is doing just that with a unique winglet. The design includes wingspan extensions of about five feet on the Cessna Citation CJ series. The winglet includes a flight control system that automatically reduces the loading on the wing when turbulence is detected. The reduced load allows for a larger winglet, which enhances performance. It also takes away the need to add additional structure. When you start to encounter gusts or maneuvers, this device will pop up either direction and alleviate that load so that there's no additional stress on the wing from what the OEM originally certified. That's really the benefit. That's what the magic is. Tamarack also debuted a winglet for airliners at the show. The airliner version can adjust the winglet alignment to optimize performance throughout the flight envelope. Garmin is getting into the head-up display business. Garmin's new HUD, known as the GHD 2100, will be linked with the G5000 avionics suite. Uh, it's really a, a great blend of engineering talent to make some technology fit in a very small, compact form factor uh, that achieves some of the same goals of larger, more expensive HUDs. We're fully capable of supporting synthetic vision system um, on the HUD. We have a uh, auto dimming feature uh, that allows it to dim from day down to uh, very dark nights and obviously some decluttering to help the pilot uh, along his path and really trying to make sure that the, uh, the HUD is hands off as much as possible uh, during those critical phases. Garmin is currently targeting super midsize, midsize and light business aircraft for its HUD. 
It's incorporated on the new Cessna Citation Longitude we showed you earlier. Turboprop pilots have for years envied something jet pilots have long had, an electronically controlled single lever power control. Well, that's now just weeks away, according to officials at Nextent Aerospace. Working with engine manufacturer General Electric, Nextent has completed flight test of the new system on their remanufactured King Air C90, dubbed the G90 XT. With the data sent to the FAA, they are expecting complete certification in about 30 days. Nextent certified the airframe upgrades and GE engines on the G90 XT, along with an upgraded panel, the Garmin G1000, about a year ago, but the electronic engine control languished until now. The changes include a digital pressurization system, engine and fuel system information integrated into the Garmin displays, and much improved environmental system. The engine upgrades from the stock Pratt & Whitney PT6 engines to the GE H75 engines result in a 20-knot increase in cruise speed at flight level 250 and a 10% reduction in direct operating costs, according to those folks at Nextent. The engines include a 4,000-hour TBO with no requirement for a hot section inspection, a significant cost saving over the stock engines. And Nextent is also working on a new project to upgrade the Bombardier Challenger 604. Improvements include a Rockwell Collins Fusion touchscreen integrated cockpit. A wing improvement program is also in the works that will bring in additional 500 nautical miles of range and the ability to climb to flight level 450. Nextent is also working on a new interior configuration that provides a more modern and flexible cabin. So now the question, are people going to buy all these new airplanes and other fancy stuff? Well, NBA traditionally kicks off with the Honeywell forecast. The company throws a nice party, tells us what the future may hold for purchases of new business jets. The forecast is usually optimistic. Well, we're projecting 2017 to be the low point for the industry. Declining deliveries this year by about uh, two, three percentage point, you're right. But then modest increase in 2018, and then 2019 to 2027, we're projecting growth actually, two to four percent with the entry in service of many new models. As in past years, large cabin aircraft are predicted to dominate sales, about 57% of new business jet deliveries. Russia, India, and China have seen a significant drop in demand for new business jets, while Brazil is kind of a bright spot. North America is expected to see a 9% reduction in new business jet purchases this year compared to last year. And don't forget, we have a lot more news about MBAA on our websites. A temporary reprieve for the Santa Monica Airport. A federal judge issued a temporary restraining order stopping the city's project to shorten the runway. An airport neighbor and a pilot filed suit claiming the city had not allowed, followed California law when it decided to hamstring the airport. The judge said the pair had a good chance of succeeding in their suit, and you can read more about it on our website. Well, last weekend found us all the way on the other side of the continent from California. The AOPA fly into Groton, Connecticut is, the, is in the wind category despite some tough weather on Saturday. AOPA Live's Paul Harrop shows us that New England turns out for a fly-in even if by car. Let's face it, the weather is what you find. Seven this morning didn't look very good if you wanted to look up. There was nothing to see except cloud. And if you find low IFR on the day of the big party, you find another way. We drove up from Morristown, New Jersey, and uh, it was a two and a half hour drive. And like they said that we couldn't fly here because of a cloud cover, so we had to drive like two hours over here and instead of flying for uh, like 15 minutes or an hour. Yeah, it would have been much cooler to fly, huh? Yeah. Well, when you got here though, did all the cool airplanes make up for the long car ride? Um, only the big ones. The small ones, meh. Ten-year-old Sebastian may be a tough customer, but everyone else seemed to enjoy the smaller ones too, like this polished and blue Cessna 170B. 6,364 people stopped in to see the event. The Friday workshops informed and the Barnstormers party entertained. And low clowns be darned, we had ourselves a fly-in with nearly 500 airplanes stopping by. DC-3 is really my favorite and the Albatross is great. So the low IFR in the morning kept maybe a few people away, but the sun burned it off middle of the day. We still had a great crowd here in Groton. It helped to have such big, beautiful visitors on the ramp. In Groton, Connecticut, Paul Harrop, AOPA Live. Thanks, Paul. That C-47 on the ramp is a Normandy veteran, by the way. We'll see more about it on a future edition of AOPA Live this week.
It was a good show. It was a great show, uh, despite the fog. We had record, uh, not record crowds, but great crowds. We did have a good good crowd, and it's great to have all the AOPA Live this viewers stop by to say hello. It's always nice to catch up with folks. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I talk to tons of AOPA Live viewers and many, always many, enjoy many. it. <laughs> As we told you at the top of the show, AOPA and all of the other GA organizations are continuing the fight against HR 2997, which gives air traffic control to an airline-dominated organization. At many aviation events, we've had a large petition for folks to sign. One person who signed in Groton is an important ally, Congressman Joe Courtney. He represents the 2nd District of Connecticut. Groton is in his district, and he stopped by the fly-in to visit with AOPA leaders and sign the petition. Okay, it's got the Congressional District in there as well. CTO2. Right. Yeah. Right. Representative Courtney joins thousands of pilots who have signed the petition. And the fly-in season isn't over just yet. Our last but certainly not least fly-in of the year to Tampa, Florida, presented by Peter O'Night Airport, is coming up on October 27th and 28th. Tampa has a long civilian and military aviation history. MacDill Air Force Base is home to much of that history, and there will be a tour of MacDill offered during the fly-in. AOPA Live's Josh Cochran has the story of MacDill and the pilots who keep our nation's military fleet aloft through aerial refueling. For over 75 years, MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa, Florida has played an essential role in our nation's military. The base is named in honor of Colonel Leslie MacDill, an early military aviator killed in a plane crash. Air Force was about to embark in a pretty uh, interesting time in its, in, its, in its service, World War II, and he probably would have ended up becoming a general in command of everything. The MacDill base has hosted a variety of missions over the years. Today, it is home to Central Command, the 6th Air Mobility Wing, which operates C-37s for executive transport, and it is home to an elite group of military working dogs. But the most visible mission at MacDill is aerial refueling. Refueling is, is what gives us that, that edge. We're able to get the fight to the enemy, you know, within 24, 48 hours, and not a lot of people have that, have that capability. These crews play an essential behind the scenes role. When we see news articles and everything of something that happened, say there was a hostage that was rescued in Syria or Afghanistan or Iraq or something like that, and we can start to associate, hey, I, I, I refueled the aircraft that were above that, that rescue scenario. That's huge. At McDill, the pilots fly mostly KC-135s. These airplanes rolled out in the 50s are still the core of our nation's military aerial refueling fleet. It was built in the 50s, which means you actually get to fly the aircraft. A lot of the aircraft that we have nowadays, uh, the computer flies for you. You tell the computer what you want it to do and it just does it. So with KC-135, it's all cables and pulleys. I'm the one making the control inputs when I fly. Uh, and I know it because it's like I'm turning a two-ton brick. It's, it's not simple all the time, but, but I really feel like I'm the one getting to be in control of the aircraft. The aerial refueling crews enjoy the unique experiences that come with the job. You get to see all sorts of different you know, aircrafts out there, and I think the view is just amazing. I mean, you open a window or a door at 26,000 feet, and it's just clear skies. You know, it's beautiful. You got a you know, cool plane behind you, and... Um, uh, I think it's the best, best view in the house. Josh Cochran, AOPA Live. The tour of McDill is just one of the many activities going on during the fly-in. Find all the details at our fly-in website. So meanwhile, back here at NBAA, this is a big show for, for the biggest business aviation show with airplanes and avionics all over the place, but it's not just all about that. There's lots of other industry meetings that go on that uh, support the rest of the year, things going on. You've got some meetings coming up uh, too about weather, right? I do actually, the last, uh, yesterday and today is, uh, for about 20 years we've done this weather meeting, it's called Friends and Partners of Aviation Weather. So Department of Interior, DOD, FAA, all the stakeholders at GA, everybody, uh -huh. This is where we improve weather products. Things like the graphical area forecast came out of this group. So we meet here every year at okay. NBAA. All right, so lots of important stuff. And that wraps things up from NBA in Las Vegas. As we mentioned earlier, we have a lot more news from the convention on our website. Thanks for joining us this week. We hope to see you again next Thursday for another edition of AOPA Live This Week.
Brightling, instruments for professionals.